And let's do this, America. That's right. Telling the story that needs to be told. This is the Family Medicine Rocks program. I know I've told Jerry this is like 15 different names of this show. But hey, I'm your host, Dr. Mike Savello. Now, but before I bring in our, our uh, esteemed co-host, um, I'm happy to announce some future interviews that are coming up later this week. Very excited. On Thursday, October 23rd at 10 a.m. Eastern time i'll have a i'll have a live interview from istanbul turkey if the internet holds up that's from the uh, wonka european conference that's the world uh family doctors conference our good friend uh, dr kyle hodebeck will be calling in uh so that's gonna be very exciting uh and also i'm trying to work through uh, uh coming up with an interview uh from someone uh from the columbia uh, university campus um, and people in the family medicine and primary care community know about this, but there was almost a closure of their family medicine residency program there. Uh, and I'm trying to get a story from the inside. So uh, pay attention to my Twitter and Facebook for those, uh, for those updates. But now, uh, let me introduce our co-host for tonight's show. The, the convener, the, the conference chair of the 2016 AAFP national conference of constituency leaders, May, 2016, our good friend, Dr. Jerry Tolbert. Uh, Jerry, how are you doing there, buddy? Good evening, Michael. Uh, uh, you feeling okay there, Jerry? Are we all right? <laughs> you're, you're just making it sound like I was some kind of evil mastermind, so I thought I would, I would play the part. <laughs> I'm doing quite well. How about you? Oh, good, good, good. So uh, uh, I know people watch every show. Uh, so you, you have this green thing behind you. Without getting into a lot of detail, uh, <laughs> explain to our audience what, the, what that deal is back there. It's a green screen. If you've ever heard of something called chroma key, where they would, uh, in the past, they would take a video signal and splice it, splice a certain color out of that video signal, and then substitute in backgrounds. Uh, that was the uh, old-fashioned way of doing things. Now you can do that digitally. I have the green screen behind me so that I can digitally replace my backgrounds. Uh, unfortunately, Blab doesn't play well with the software that I normally use to do that, so I couldn't do that tonight. But that's what that's for. Cool. So, uh, so tonight's topic, a very important topic uh, tonight, uh, the dangers of prescription drug abuse. This was brought on by our good friend, uh, Dr. Wanda Filer, the president of the American Academy of Family Physicians. She was on the Dr. Oz show today talking about that. We'll talk about her appearance a little bit, but I do want to just dive into this very serious topic. Um, I do have some statistics that I want to uh, share uh, with all of you. Um, you know, the and when we talk about uh, pain medications, we're talking about narcotics, we're talking about opioid pain medications. People you know, probably have heard the names of things like you know, Vicodin and Percocet and Norco and those type of uh, pain medications. The use of opioid pain relievers in the United States has, tr uh, has quadrupled between 1999 and 2010. Um, among the 22,000 deaths related to pharmaceutical overdoses in, in 2011, nearly three-fourths involved opioids in 2012. Uh, the, the U.S. healthcare professionals wrote uh, enough prescriptions, 259 million uh, for every American adult to have a, a bottle of pills. And, I mean, Jerry, th this is just a, 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 an ongoing um you know, uh, danger to our patients. Uh, we're going to get into solutions. Everybody wants to jump into the solutions, but we're yeah. kind of talking about, you know, the problems and things. And I have patients all the time, you know, asking me for, for, for pain medications. And, and, uh, it's a tough problem out there, Jerry. For sure. I have, um, unique, and I, I'm sure that a lot of States now have these, these kind of restrictions, but Kentucky has put some unique restrictions on what we can and can't do for prescribing opiates and how we prescribe them and long-term use, especially. And because of that, Kentucky is now not just facing a prescription drug problem with opiates, but the, because of the crackdown, we're facing a major issue with heroin. So it is a huge issue in this area. Uh, abuse of opioid medications is big and and it's something that, that we all deal with. And, and around here, you know, at least one or two people that have have had issues. And so it's going to be interesting to see. Um, I'm going to drop some uh, links in the chat room here and, and people who are watching uh, after the fact, I'm going to 
put these uh, in some show notes um, at drmikesville.com, but I'm going to share some some more statistics from the uh, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, every day, 44 people in the U.S. die from overdose uh, of prescription painkillers, and many more become addicted. Um, and, you know, on the on the Oz show today, um, you know, our good friend, uh, Dr. Filer, you know, went through some questions, which I'm going to go through uh, with you uh to kind of you know ask your doctor you know, this is this is stuff where where people can just ask their doctor about you know uh, prescription pain medications and i'm just going to run through these uh quickly here that we can talk about them you know number one what is the goal of taking the prescription mainly you know prescription pain medications um how uh and when should i be taking these pills how long should I be taking these pills? Are there any risks uh, to me uh, for taking these pills? And, and what should I do with extra pills? And, you know, um, this is ways that, that people can really participate in, the, in their health care because, you know, too often, you know, people just get a prescription and, you know, just say, oh, yeah, I'll just take this. And uh, um, I think it's a way where Jerry uh, just got dropped off <laughs> and, uh I'm just going to keep talking. Oops, hit the wrong button. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, and, you know, it's, you know, people just, 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 just take these pain medications sometimes and, you know, just don't even ask questions or you know, people are curious about, you know, how long you should be taking these medicines. And maybe that's kind of, you know, part of the issue on, on working through this, uh, you know, uh, using pain medications appropriately. Agreed. There's also a huge problem with folks that are that are attempting to medicate things that and this is a long discussion and I'm not going to I'm not going to dive into it just yet. But th that idea of of appropriate use of those medications, are we using them for things that they really are helpful for or are we using them as a band aid on things that really need to be fixed? And that's a big problem that we have in this area is there are a lot of folks that are using these medicines inappropriately or asking for them in inappropriate situations. So it's more than just people that don't understand how to use them. It's people that are actively trying to abuse them. Uh, this, you know, the state of Kentucky has had significant issues with these. There's actually a, a um, 2011, 2010 documentary called the Oxycontin Express that talks about an airplane that used to travel from central in eastern Kentucky down to Florida. People would get off of the airplane. They would walk down the street to all of the pain clinics in Florida. They would get their stash of sometimes hundreds, if not thousands of uh, opioid painkillers and benzodiazepine medications. And then they would bring them back on that airplane that night uh, to eastern Kentucky so that they could sell them and make enough money until the next month when that flight went down again. Really? Yeah. So it in this area, opioid abuse has been a significant issue, and that's why the state of Kentucky passed some massive law changes. Uh, there's a law called House Bill 1 that went through a couple of years back that essentially now says every person getting chronic pain medications, opioid medications for more than 48 hours essentially have to be on a pain contract. They have to get all of their medications from the same source, from the same pharmacy. Uh, we have a, a Kentucky all schedule uh, prescribing um, reporting for all scheduled drugs. And so we have to run uh, a, a, a report on all of the patients that are getting opiate medications, even if they're getting them short term, it's, a, in, it's encouraged that we run that. And uh, most medications uh, have to follow very specific rules. And, and the scheduling here has, has been fairly strict as far as even medications that were not always considered. So hydrocodone, there was a big change in the federal government made a change to how they, they schedule hydrocodone. But Kentucky was actually more strict on hydrocodone even before that change went into effect. So it's been a big deal here for several years. Um, <clears throat> and there's been a lot of states, and even Ohio has taken some steps um, as well. You know, I mean, we, we, we have a you know, prescription drug monitoring program, um, you know, where we can Wars. search. Um, yeah. Um, so people who don't, you know, know who that, know what that is, especially the lay public. I mean, it, it, it's essentially a database. Um and it's not in all 50 states yet. Um, so it, it, it actually we live right here. Um, we live right here, like kind of on the border of Ohio and Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we can do a search, you know, for people on this side of the border um, of Ohio. But, uh, you know, people go, you know, 20 minutes or 30 minutes across the border to Pennsylvania to for a uh, f to a pharmacy there or something like that. We not may not know 
um, you know, that they are, you know, getting their prescriptions there. Um, and Jerry, just like you said, I mean, a, a lot of states are have, uh, cracking down on their own type of um, uh, state level policies. And of course, you know, from the federal level, you know, they did change the schedule um, of the uh, some of these pain medications. For example, you, you can't get refills on that. Um, and even cracking down to, you know, um, unfortunately, you know, even, you know, family docs um, like you and I, you know, may not be able to prescribe this unless, you know, you go through the A, B, C, D uh, steps uh, mm-hmm. to prescribe them. Um, and I know a lot of docs, especially, you know, in our community here who aren't doing that anymore and say, hey, you have to go to uh, a pain clinic or something like that to to get your pain medication. So, so I mean, I guess it's good and bad where you're getting some some of these solutions that are coming in. Obviously, it's still a problem, but uh, I'm glad that you know from a local, state, and federal level that there are some steps that are trying to be taken. For sure, and actually, here uh, it is next to impossible to get a primary care physician to write for chronic opioid medications. The only thing that you can get is acute. Uh, short-term medications for 48 hours or less out of most physicians. They just don't write for the chronic medications because it's such a hassle as far as paperwork and 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 processing and making sure that you're keeping up with everybody. Uh, and that's why everybody's abusing heroin now. So, uh, Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, yeah, we've heard that a lot too. And, you know, as far as other drugs of abuse, you know, that are out there, um, you know, methamphetamine is big in, in, in our community here. Um, not so much heroin, I guess, yet. Um, but uh, I guess, you know, people are diverting to to other types of uh, drugs of abuse that, that are out there and, and we're dealing with a lot of that here um, in kind of semi-rural, semi-suburban America. Um, and it's just, it's just, it's such, such a problem out there. And, and, you know, I mean, th- th- this show today, we kind of was focused on, you know, pain medications, you know, but there's other, you know, drugs of abuse and anxiety medications and those type of medications that, that people, um, you know, you know, either, you know, get a, from a physician or get illegally, um, then they, uh, you know, they abuse those as well. And, and that's also a big problem that I don't even know how to tackle some of that. It would probably, you know, um, you know, more regulations, unfortunately. Um, but it's just, it's just a tough thing. So we have this conversation a lot in this area because there are so many folks that are having issues with heroin overdoses and, and, and prescription opioid overdoses prior to the, to the house bill one. And so one of the things that we talk about on a regular basis is the fact that there have been thousands of years of people abusing opioid medications, uh, First, it was the opium poppy directly, then morphine. The Bayer Corporation created heroin to get people off of morphine as an alternative. Uh, Heroin became a drug of abuse, and so we developed methadone to get people off of heroin. Uh, And now we have buprenorphine to get people off of methadone. And uh, the list goes on and on and on and on over millennia, not just centuries, not just decades, but millennia. People are going to find ways to abuse medications like this as long as we have receptors in our brain that feed them. So I, I honestly don't know that there's an answer to this problem that is going to present itself in any time soon. There, the, you know, a lot of what we talk about here is how do you treat the underlying disorder that they are trying to self-medicate with those opioid medications? Because a lot of times it's not pain. A lot of times the pain that they have and the issues that they have with pain are not only increasingly related to depression and anxiety and all those other things you talked about as far as other medicines, but also related to the fact that they've been on chronic opioids for so long. Yeah, let's, uh, I mean, you know, let's really get into that. I mean, it's just, you know, um, treating kind of the, the underlying, you know, type of problem, you know, whatever, what it is, because, you know, if, if it is, you know, mental health related, that kind of branches off into the whole problem in this country of, you know, inadequate, you know, mental health, uh, you know, treatments in this country. Um, and when people aren't adequately treated for their mental health, you know, it manifests in other types of symptoms, mainly, not mainly pain, but pain is one of them. Um, and people, you know, say, Hey, you know, I mean, I, I don't, uh, I don't need, you know, medications like, you know, Prozac and Paxil, and I, I need this pain medicine. That's what's going to help my pain. Or I need something to really help me sleep. I don't need a a depression medication. And and it's those and that type of conversations. Right now. That, exactly. 
exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I mean, you know, uh, you know, our good friend Mary in, in the chat room, you know, like you know, what do patients do when they can't afford $200 to see a pain uh, specialist? That is a great question. $30 <laughs> for heroin on the street. Yeah. That, that's one of the options there, you know? And uh, you know, another question, you know, it's, uh, are our muscle relaxers addictive? And, and uh, what, what did you type in there, uh, Jerry? Um, I just, uh, to answer the question quickly, you were in the middle of that. I didn't want to interrupt, but to, 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 Muscle relaxers uh, usually come from two two specific lines. Uh, they're they're medications that are actually related to antihistamines, as far as chemically speaking, and so they're not necessarily addictive in a large, broad sweeping term muscle relaxants. But there are a lot of medicines that are used as muscle relaxants that may have an effect similar to what we call benzodiazepines, which are anxiety medicines. Uh, and then there are a couple of muscle relaxants, specifically one called Soma, that uh, has a huge abuse potential and has a pretty pretty high rate of addiction uh, if it's used incorrectly. So, so the short answer is most of them are not. And if you use them appropriately, then 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 they are actually a good adjunct to physical therapy and stretching. Uh, but uh, they are not always going to be uh, addictive to any large degree. But but there are some folks that still abuse those types of drugs as well. So. Um, but, but it's interesting, uh, you know, uh, conversation to have as far as, you know, what is the underlying component of what's going on, you know, that's manifesting itself, that's showing itself, you know, as pain, you know, and, and, uh, um, you know, those are conversations that need to be done, but unfortunately with this, with this broken healthcare system that we have that, you know, you know, doctors like me and doctors like you, you know, we only have a few minutes just to try to encapsulate all of that. Um, you know, the strength of primary care and family medicine is that we do have this ongoing relationship with people uh, that we can try to see kind of what's going on. But, um, you know, that the difficulty in treating these these illnesses um, you know, are, you know, kind of the system that we're in now. It's, it's, it's really hard to to dive deep. Uh, to get to the bottom of things. And, and sometimes, you know, um, you know, uh, some physicians just kind of say, Hey, you know, take this. And then we can talk about it the next time you come in. And, and unfortunately maybe it puts them down the road of potentially um, addictive and uh, abusing medications. For sure. Uh, the, the problem, unfortunately, is that with most psychological conditions, they're not easily fixed. There is no cure. And there is rarely a time when they are going to be fixed rapidly. And that's what both patients and physicians often want out of this relationship. It's kind of the weatherman thing I was talking about before. We're not really giving you 100% answer to anything that we do. And most of the time, we don't even know which medications are going to, from a psychological standpoint, benefit you. We can make some good guesses based on the, the limited amount that we know about the neurochemistry and the way that the, the chemicals work on the brain. But from a standpoint of take this pill and get better, it's not something that happens. Uh, it just doesn't, uh, especially with mental illness. And so when we talk about depression, we talk about anxiety. Uh, that's a, there's a reason why cognitive behavioral therapy and, and, and counseling are just as effective most times as medication in improving the symptoms. It's because this is an issue that takes a much deeper sort of intervention than just throwing a pill at it, uh, even if that is to control pain. And so, um, Sorry, there are a couple of questions here. First, we're both family physicians, family medicines uh, trained uh, with with uh, specialty in, in primary care, family medicine. Um, I'm practicing actually in, in a corporate setting, meaning I work for an employer, several employers and take care of all their employees and their families. And uh, Mike, Mike's in private practice in in uh, an open, full, full spectrum family medicine, right? You guys do pretty much everything? Uh, we're, we're not full spectrum, um, but, you know, but we take not care of a... Guy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and, and Sean, our good friend, yeah, asked a very good question, you know, abuse potential, you know, I mean, what is the abuse potential of a medication? And, and that is a huge question, um, you know, as the, far as the short easy answer is any medication can be used incorrectly and it can be used to gain a benefit that is not the intended part of the, the drug. I mean, that's the short answer. If you, if you can take a medicine, so, so even things like cough medicine, dextromethorphan, which is the main ingredient in Robitussin, if you chug a bottle of, of uh, yeah, you can actually, that's literally what I'm saying. Uh, if you chug a bottle of dextromethorphan, uh, you can hallucinate. Uh, it's a side effect, not a, a intended effect of the drug, but it's, it's a, one of the things that can be abused about that drug. So yeah, there are some, there are several drugs that can be abused. Now, the problem is, is that some of them don't give you a benefit. And the, the issue here is, you know, the, the, when we talk about abuse potential, 
the drugs that give you a massive benefit, whether that's a uh, depression of emotion, so so the the high that people feel, or the the ability to sleep when you feel like you can't sleep, those are very sort of tricky things. Those are the things that people are are trying to find. And so when that benefit is that high, and the drug is that easy to get, and it acts that quickly, uh, the abuse potential there is much much higher than say for Tylenol, where you're not going to have a whole lot of benefit out of it. And if you take too much of it, you just shoot your liver and die a horrible, painful death. So, you know, from that standpoint, some drugs have a lower abuse potential because of the actual benefit and the the risks of taking them. Exactly. And it also you know depends on the patient, not that I'm blaming patients. And, um, you know, if, if they have a, a history of, of abuse of other substances, uh, whether they're prescription or not, you know, alcohol or illegal uh, uh substances and i didn't want to go into marijuana because that's like a whole different topic <laughs> it's, true. I mean, it's, it's true i mean but you look at alcohol and you look at, at nicotine and you look at caffeine i mean these are all legal substances but they are all incredibly uh, similar as far as abuse potential and addiction potential to a lot of these other drugs i mean it, it's a matter of scale at that point but you know you have alcoholics and you have caffeine addicts and you have you know you have people that are that are addicted to nicotine so it's not really that different Exactly. Exactly. You know, and it's just, oh man, it's, yeah, I mean, it, 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 and, you know, and Sean said it kind of comes back to mental health challenges. I mean, this whole issue of, of the dangers of, of prescription drug abuse, I mean, it's, it's, it, these are symptoms of other things that are happening, you know, in our healthcare system, whether it's our, it's our broken healthcare system where, you know, we have to see patients, you know, every seven minutes, every 10 minutes. Um, I get 20 whether, minutes of mine, so I'm, je- I'm actually spoiled, so. I hate you. Uh, <laughs> That's why I have the job I have. I mean, I'll be to be brutally honest, it is. Um, and you know, the in- inadequate healthcare system or inadequate mental health care system that we have. Right. And you know, I mean, e- even if we do identify people who are you know substance abuse uh, patients, you know, what is the substance abuse treatment program that we have in this country? Right. Zero. You know, well, very- hey. It's limited. I wouldn't call yeah. it zero, but it's limited. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. I'm exaggerating there. Yeah. Well, but, but what I was going to say is the substance abuse program is actually better than the mental health, which is kind of the sad state of things. It's kind of like, you know, you have to triage between it's that it's that sad Sophie's choice kind of thing from a standpoint of, OK, we either we put our money into mental health specifically or we put our money into drug rehab. Well, because drug rehab is killing people and mental health is killing people, too. Which one do you choose? Yeah, and and, and I've learned uh, by by being on our county mental health board, you know, at a state level, um, you know, depending on what state you're in, you know, that pot of money sometimes is the same pot of money, right? Um, and which gets tricky. So, like, who gets what? And that gets obviously very political. Um, as PCP, do you recommend non traditional therapies to patients? I was say, I'm typing to answer that, but uh, the answer I was typing was sure. Um, the, the thing is, is that traditional therapy even includes more than just medication. And that's part of the problem is that there's this mental block, physical therapy, stretching, uh, strengthening exercises, appropriate movement, correct lifting. We have something like physical therapists have something that gets called a lot of different things around here. They call it back school, but essentially it's teaching you how to lift, how to lift appropriately, when to know that you can and can't lift something. And, the, and just saying no, when somebody asks you to lift something that you can't lift. Um, but, but, you know, when it comes to other types of pain, it's not just low back pain, although that's the most common one around here, you know, you know, massage is, is one of the things that, that we tend to recommend and, um, you know, just simple cryotherapy ice, (laughs) uh, can get you a long way with a lot of pain. So there's, there's lots of different therapies and there's lots of different things that we can do. So yeah, the non-traditional stuff for sure. Um, I but know, I mean, I you know, a lot of the non-traditional things, you know, are, are out-of-pocket expenses, uh, which kind of adds sure. to, and, you know, and, and it's a lot of this, I mean, a lot of medicine in general comes down to managing expectations, you know, because, right, exactly. you know, when people come in, you know, to see us, they're like, oh, you know, I, I would like this fixed uh, in 20 minutes because I have to do this, this, and this, or, you know, people have real problems. I have to go do this thing um, that's going to hurt me worse. So fix me now. 
but uh you know but i have blue collar people I, I have laborers that come in you know that have to work you know and and you know they have this story and it's really credible and you know they're not abusing things and um but you know if you prescribe that narcotic you know that you know there are consequences to that you know i mean they're you know they'll potentially be drug tested um and if there's a side effect or if there's an accident that happens at work uh, that's work related, you know, that could come back on me. Um, but you know, but this guy has been doing this job forever and it's just, you know, they the problem. Kind of get through and, and that's, that's kind of the, the challenges of, 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 you know, being a primary care physician when you get some of this stuff in your office. I, I agree to a certain extent, but that's the problem. This guy is doing a job that he may not be physically capable of doing anymore. And so one of the things that I encourage my patients to do a lot of times is, listen, you have to step back and analyze, is this, even though this is the job I'm, I've been trained for, is the, even though it's the only thing that I have right now, do I have to stay here? Is there another option? And there is oftentimes another option. It's never easy. It's always hard, but it is almost always more safe and healthier. Let's put it, that is probably the best word for it, than the alternative. And so I have them have that constant conversation. If there is an issue that, is, that keeps coming up and keeps coming up, I don't pull punches on that because honestly, there, there's so so Paul Brand is a is a was a missionary to India that wrote a book um, that talked about the gift of pain and talked about how this idea of uh, these people that would develop leprosy they couldn't feel anything and so they would they would develop these ulcerations and they would develop these sores and they would you know they would lose body parts literally because they couldn't feel it. Um, you know, and, and in there, he talks about pain is a harbinger. It is a, it is a, a warning sign to the rest of our body that, Hey, you are doing something wrong. It is, it is something that is hurting you for a reason. We it's have a big red reason. flag exactly. and you have to, you have to listen to your body. Exactly. Right? You can't just ignore that. And you, and you know, literally when we're talking about these opioid pain medications, a lot of what they're doing is just blocking the signal. They aren't fixing the problem. They're stopping your brain from recognizing that that problem still exists, even though it's still there. And so one of the things that we have to be very careful of is that when we use those pain medications, excuse me, in, it is a protective mechanism. Exactly. Um, that's one of the things that, that they were just saying. Um, in the chat room there. It, the, the issue yeah. is, is that it is a, exactly, it is a short-term fix. It is not the long-term correction of bad and an improper form, you know, and, and I don't want to say bad, good, bad, whatever. It, it's, it's improper. It's unhealthy. It's unsafe. Those are the things that we're trying to fix. We're trying to fix the things that are going to actually cause you damage. And that's where pain comes in. Pain says, hey, listen, you're doing something that you shouldn't be. Fix it. Um, that's, that's why there's an old joke about the doctor that talks about if, if it hurts, don't do it. Um, you know, that's the whole idea. Yeah, Jerry, it hurts. It hurts when it hurts when I when I do this. Right. So don't do that. Wait. What What should I do? Yeah. Don't do that. <laughs> oh. Um. I mean, it, there, there's a certain level of 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 correction that we can do. I mean, and, and getting people functional, and getting them moving. In fact, you know. <laughs> Again, I this is I should have warned you before we started talking about this. I have lectures that I give on this stuff a lot of times because of the Kentucky issues that we have. So I, I am kind of monopolizing here. I apologize. But no, 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 no. It's good. There is one big piece that I always talk about, which is, and this is something that they were talking about in the in the chat here, is so you know, one of the things that so one of the things that we did as a, as a group, as physicians, and, and I will stand by this, I would, I would testify to this into, and testify to this in a court of law is we created as physicians, a generation of people with chronic low back pain because we treated them improperly. We didn't know it at the time. So it was an unknowing thing. We didn't do it on purpose, but we created them because we started recommending bed rest on a regular basis. We started recommending that, they use these opioid medications as a, as a pain reliever on a regular basis. We started recommending that these things were happening. It's not that we did it not, we did it in thinking that we were taking away their pain and that we were trying to help them. And, you know, that was our goal all along. We were never trying to, to debilitate them, but the sign now is very clear muscles here heal under lines of stress. So movement is one of the most important things for healing an injury to a muscle or a tendon. If you have a fracture, you have a broken bone, then yeah, those types of medications are important. They're going to help you. If you have low back pain because you bent over and lifted something that you shouldn't have that was too heavy or you lifted it incorrectly, then that does not need opioid pain medications from the standpoint of getting it better and keeping it that way. 
it needs stretching. It needs relaxation exercises. It needs sometimes things like therapeutic massage or physical therapy. Sometimes it needs muscle relaxants. Sometimes it needs, uh, you know, just the ability to, to have time to heal more than anything. You have to give it a break. So, so that relative rest that we talk about, those restrictions that we put on people uh, that are going to say, listen, for the next two, three, four days, you probably shouldn't lift more than about 20 pounds at, you know, at most, excuse me. And even that should be rare, you know, and, and giving people the time they need. That's the other side of this. We were just talking about it. You mentioned it. You have these people that have to go back to work or they have to do this, or they have to, you know, I have to be there tomorrow because otherwise they're going to take my job. That right. falls on the employers. I mean, that falls on the, that this whole group of employers that say, listen, if you get hurt, I don't care. You know, if we would all just be nice to each other and everybody just followed that rule, that would be 90% of what we deal with, with these chronic pain issues, because unfortunately you have to have time. It's not going to get better tomorrow. It's not going to get better in four days. It's probably not going to get better in two weeks. It's going to take a long time for this to improve itself and get back to where it needs to be. Because not only do you have to heal, but then you have to build back what you lost while you were taking the time to heal. Right. Yeah. I, I didn't realize that, uh, that you did talks on this, uh, before. I mean, it's awesome. I mean, no, these are lectures to patients. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I have done a couple, but most of what we talk about is, you know, this is the conversation that we have at every state meeting for Kentucky. It, it, I mean, it keeps coming back to this stuff, rightly so, because this is such a huge issue in our state. Yeah. 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 I, you know, it's just, it, it's just every day in my office, you know, I, and I hear these stories, you know, and it's just, it, it's, it, it's, it's, uh, it's so hard just to kind of go through that, you know, and not only go through that, go through that, you know, patient after patient after patient. And, and, you know, and, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying that just to complain or to bitch or anything <laughs> like that. I mean, it's just, th th these are things that, that primary care docs, that family docs go through every day. And it's just, you know, uh, a, a lot of them, you know, just said, Hey, here, here here's a pill, get out of my office. Um, well, or, like you know, I'm, 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 I'm an hour and a half behind, right. you know, take this, you know, and we could talk about it next time. You know, and uh, um, I mean, but it, it's it, it kind of it, it's another symptom. It's just like, you know, because because, you know, uh, uh, another thing where providers and and physicians, you know, blame the patient saying, oh, you know, blah, 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 blah. You know, it's and then it's another thing where the where the legislators blame the docs and say, oh, you're bad docs. And the bad docs say, oh, no, there's bad patients. And that's another symptom of kind of, you know, what's going on here. And it just kind of goes around and around and around. And, and um, you know, people just don't kind of own up to it and say, hey, can we just sit down and talk about this? Can we talk about stretching? Can we talk about rest? Can we talk about, you know, that type of stuff? Taking a day off. <laughs> I mean, that's that's I, right. I, I, I consistently, for people that come in with low back pain or, or, or injuries, and, and, and Mary brings up a good point. Mary went in the chat, um, or Lloyd speaking as Mary. I don't know who's on there. But, uh, but palliative care hospice, they all are very huge. That's, that's a totally separate issue to me uh, than what we're talking about. Um, you know, those types of things, if somebody is dying, and they are in pain, there is yes. very little benefit to not giving them medicine. There's, 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 there's no real detriment to you giving them medication for their pain. Uh, right. In fact, hospice uses things like morphine very well in, in terms of, of regulating um, issues like air hunger and things where you have this sort of impending sense of doom that is even worse than, you know, than just the symptoms that you may be having as far as pain goes. And so, yeah, so, so palliative care is a huge, huge, uh, pain management that's a whole a separate it. exactly yeah, that's a it, whole set that, that's not part of this conversation but right, but exactly. i definitely get where they're coming from you know right but that's um, and that's that's the difference here and that's where people get up in arms a lot of times the legislators that you're talking about too one of the things in kentucky that they always brought up was okay well what happens if somebody comes in and they have cancer and they can't you know and they they're right gonna, exactly well i'm gonna give them to them because they have cancer right. they're dying and there's nothing that i'm going to do that is going to make them worse six months from now or a year from now, two years from now. But if I take somebody with low back pain who bent over and picked something up instead of squatting or, or however you want to look at it, they injured themselves. They have a musculoskeletal injury and it is temporary. They have the potential, if I don't treat them correctly, that in six months, a year from now, two years from now, excuse me, they could develop chronic low back pain because of something I do. Right. You know, if their life expectancy is six months, 
give him the pain medicine. Don't kill him with it, but give it to him. Let him be comfortable. Let them live in peace for the time that they're still alive. It's, it's, it's hard. It is really, really hard. Oh yeah. 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 And we, and you know, I, I've taken care of patients like that. I mean, you know, palliative care and hospice patients and it's just, you hear those cases and it's just, I mean, you just have to keep them comfortable because yeah, you're right, Jerry. I mean, there's nothing physically that I'm going to be able to do other than keep them comfortable and, uh, you know, manage their pain better. Um, Jerry, you're good. You're you're answering these questions in the chat room. There, you're like you are the man. <laughs> well, and I'm listening. To you. I don't want to interrupt you, and that's yeah, I want to answer no. the questions too. So, no, no, that's great. That's great. Yeah, I mean, our our, our friend Nurse Pammy said, you know, the yeah. docs here in California. You know, it's it's hard to prescribe payment. It's it's like that everywhere. It's like that in this state. Right. Um, I've had people in my community, um, prim- primary care docs in my community who, you know, I get their patients and they're like, oh, you know, they sent us to pain management, you know? Um, so the yes, entire state of Kentucky is that way. Um, so there's a comfort level in some states um, or there's some state laws and say, hey, you know, in order to prescribe pain medicine, you have to do A, B, C, D, and E. And there's a lot of docs that say, hey, forget that. Just go to pain management. So, so yeah, it's happening across the country. It's kind of trying to be part of the solution of, of what's happening. Um <laughs> multitasking like a champ that's good <laughs> that's why i love blab i don't want to make this to being a blab of a blab right yeah exactly uh, <laughs> but, no, uh, and, and you hit on a very important point there too which is if you don't have <laughs> thanks um if you don't have a specific let's say that you have training in dealing with palliative care specifically you right. know what the limits of the body are going to be for doing those, for using those medications. You know what you've people been trained are there. Yeah. Exactly. You, and you've seen it. You've done it. You've had, you have right. not only, you don't not only have the knowledge, but you have the experience to do both. If you are somebody who is in a community situation, who has seven minutes with each patient, who has, is seeing somebody else's patients on a significantly regular basis. And if you're in a group practice, that happens. Um, we can't avoid it a lot of times. And, and so, you know, if, if you're in that situation, you have seven minutes to decide whether or not somebody is not only telling you the truth, but also whether or not the pain medicine is an appropriate thing for them. You're doing all the clinical stuff as well as being the, the arbiter of whether or not this person is actually being honest. That is a nightmare. Seven minutes to do that? I mean, I, I can't even, you know, I have trouble, you know, yes, you get those gut feelings and you do have to trust them as soon as somebody walks through the room, walks into the room. But, but there are certain people that that may give off that vibe of, oh, this is a drug seeker. And then all of a sudden, 10 minutes in the conversation, you figure out that they really have massive issues that they have had, you know, let's say that they were in a massive accident and, and, you know, even if it was 15 years ago, but they broke 15 different bones and now they've got these, you know, chronic arthritis issues and things that we are not going to be able to, to fix with stretching that movement is going to make it better, but it's not going to get them where they need to be, to be functional. Uh, to be able to take care of themselves, to to shower and to to make their food and to to take care of another loved one that they have to provide care for, then yeah, they may have a special situation that needs those medicines on a certain level. They don't necessarily have to have massive doses of those, but you know the the point where it takes the edge off of that pain and allows them to be functional. You can't figure that out in seven minutes. I'm sorry. Right. And that's that's the, the you know a lot of stuff that we come back to about our broken healthcare system comes down to the fact that we're now relegated to taking seven minutes to take care of somebody. Yeah, and it's even in our community here, and it's probably happening in other communities too, where even the emergency room, if if they know, or if you're a frequent person there, if they know it's a chronic, uh, you know, pain situation or back pain situation, um, they're not going to prescribe narcotics. They'll be like, go back to your primary care physician. Um, and you know, another thing for for us to uh, uh, for us to deal with. Um, so, well, and but the thing in Kentucky here, and, and I'm sure Ohio is similar, and I know Texas and California. We were just talking about this. If you go to the ER and they prescribe you pain medicine and you have a pain contract with another physician, you have now violated that pain. Oh, contract you're done. And your primary care is going to cancel your contract and they're not going to prescribe you anymore. Yeah. So, so from that standpoint, the ERs have actually been turning people away from those types of medicines because now with our electronic medical record systems, if you're a hospital in practice and say the patient comes in, they're part of that hospital in practice so they can see the records. The ER sees the records that say, hey, this person's on a pain contract. They're not going to give them anything because it's going to violate their pain contract. So they can tell as soon as they walk through the door, literally that they are there and they are already on pain medicine. They can see, excuse me, electronically when that last uh, pain medication prescription was written. 
And it's very easy these days to call, even if it's not on the reporting system yet, you can call the pharmacy where the patient was supposed to have gone to get their medicine and find out exactly what they got and how much. So it's, it's getting a lot harder to do what a lot of the traditional ways of abusing the, the medications really did. And as these, as health IT, and this is a whole other conversation, but as health IT interoperability becomes a thing, it's going to be a lot harder to abuse those medications without having some form of, of, you know, alternate identities and, and, and things like that. It's, it's going to be tricky, which is good. Yeah. Thus pushing people more to heroin and illegal, uh, well, it, drugs and that's a thousand years, man. There, there are, <laughs> I'm not joking. I mean, 2000 years, there, there are records of opiate and opioid or well, opium use, uh, and, and abuse. Uh, in you know, two thousand year old records in China, it's not something that we're going to get away from. Wait, if, you, if you haven't fixed it by now, you're not going to fix it. I mean, eventually, when we have molecular level, uh, you know, improvements, when we have improvements in mental health, when we have improvements in in the ability to to actually take care of problems rather than putting a band aid on a bloody stump, uh, then yeah, it's going to be it, it may get better. But there's always going to be somebody willing to abuse substances. I mean, hello, caffeine. Is that really caffeine, Cherry? Hmm. You know? Yeah, allegedly. Allegedly, I, it's Diet I Coke. muted I it know. when I opened it, but I promise I opened it while I was sitting here. So I don't know. What do what the people in the chat room think? Do you think that's really kind of Diet Coke? I don't know. Well, we're going to have to get that tested here somehow. You joke about that. They're actually in, um, so one of the one of the things when you talked about methamphetamine, and Kentucky has already gone through its methamphetamine phase, is on the other side now, and now we're into heroin, which is lovely, let me tell you. Uh, but during our methamphetamine phase, <laughs> special that, <ad. laughs> uh, during our methamphetamine phase, we had uh, – some chemists in this area and, and this is, you know, everybody's trying to stay ahead. So the cops innovate. So then the, the, the pushers innovate, the, the people creating these drugs innovate. Uh, they had a way to create methamphetamine in a 20 ounce pop bottle basically. And I said, pop, yes, I'm from the central uh, region of Ohio, Kentucky. Indiana. No, I say pop. pop. I, don't I know. Say I know. Soda. See, see, and Brandis no. agrees. So, so yeah. So, so exactly. um, I, I actually say soft drinks typically, but the, the pop bottle thing what? comes from when I was a kid. Um, okay. I, I'm, so I, hey, do you we'll, hear we'll my circle, voice? We'll, we'll circle Midwestern, back Midwestern, Midwestern yeah. non-accent accent. Um, <laughs> anyway, so, but they could, in a 20 ounce pop bottle, they could make methamphetamine. And so uh, there were tons of stories of people that would be, they would have it in their little Mountain Dew bottle and they'd be drinking their liquid methamphetamine while they were talking to the cops. And, uh, you know, they would get busted because they would tip their hand at some point. And so, you know, it was this whole idea that there was a, It's that it's that, you know, build a better mouse trap. So then the mouse is gonna, you know, advance his, his tactics. And you know, you excuse me, what was it in um the untouchables? You bring a knife, they bring a gun, you bring a gun, they bring a they bring a rocket launcher, you bring a rocket launcher, they bring a tank. It wasn't in the untouchables, but that you know, the idea is just escalation. And that's what's that's what it's gonna be. No, I thought that, I saw that on Bugs Bunny. So I and I <laughs> know that's a, that's kind of how it feels most of the time. <laughs> It feels like Roadrunner and Wiley Coyote. That's right. And if, if if people who don't know what that is, then just Google it. You'll, 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 you'll <laughs> now you're making me feel old, but I'm not old, so that's not fair. <laughs> yeah, we're we're in the wrong demographic. I don't know. Uh, all right. So um, before we start to close up here, because we've been talking a lot here, I, I did want to talk about just um, our good friend Wanda Filer on the Doctor Ross show. Mm -hmm. That is just awesome. Um, yes. And uh, we applaud her for that. Um, you know, she went on in May a few months ago, um, more when the whole really, you know, hating on Dr. Oz was happening. Uh, and people were like, oh, is this a good idea? Is this a bad idea? Um, but, you know, you and I talked to Jerry, you know, that I think it's, it, it's, a, I thought it's a good idea to sure. reach out to a population uh, that, um, you know, we would never reach, meaning the American Academy of Family Physicians would never reach. Um, and, you know, they need primary care physicians too. They need family physicians too. Um, and, you know, the aftermath of that first appearance really was like, oh, what was the big deal? Yeah, it's kind of uh, like so, uh, ICD-10. <clears throat> Sorry. Oh, that's my guy. We'll have to circle back to that. Uh <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, today's appearance and I'm going to put on Dr. Mike uh, it was funny, Jerry, because when I put her first appearance on YouTube, like I, my YouTube page almost got 
uh, it like, melted. <laughs> no, it almost got like uh, delisted or canceled. Oh, uh, <laughs> oh because of it was copyrighted material. I got I had copyrighted material. Uh, you got to see it took this. <laughs> it took him it took him two months to take to do the uh, copyright thing, uh, but I was afraid because it'd be like, oh, they might like shut me down. Uh, so uh, <laughs> you but. I know, but we're going to try that again and, and see. Um, so, yeah, so it was cool that she went on. Um, and she was on with, I want to get this right, um, the spokesperson for the American Dental Association uh, mm-hmm. as well. So there were, there were two of them for that segment there. Um, and it's cool. I mean, it's uh, one is awesome. Uh, we hope that she does more of these type of appearances, not only on this show, but other type of shows, uh, kind of like are out of the box Um shows where uh, we uh, um, not really uh, would be would find uh, so applaud uh, applause to her um, and you know just kind of summing up what what uh, what what her message was you know when you do get a prescription um, whatever it is not only if it's a pain medication but for other medication you know what's the goal of taking the medication how long should you be on the medication what are the risks uh, to being on the medication, you should ask that. Um, what should I do with the extra pills? You know, there's a lot of you know programs, uh, take back programs um, that we have here locally, and they happen nationwide. They happen every few months uh, where they do take back uh, prescription uh, medications. Uh, so you should do that. So that was the, that was her main message today, um, and uh, uh, and I think it was a good message. So. Um, I think we're just kind of winding up here. I think I think people have have, uh, have gotten sick of us talking. So <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted, I wanted to point out too. I mean, if you look at this, FamilyDoctor.org and 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 the AFP both today have really been pushing this this uh, pocket card. So the wallet card. You're gonna and you said you're gonna put that up, but this idea of you know uh, of collaboration. Yeah, you know, it's it's that if you can't beat uh, somebody don't join them necessarily, but kind of infiltrate them. <laughs> kind, of, kind of like our old joke about infiltrating the Academy. Um, you know, if, if there's a, <laughs> if there's a, uh, you know, if there's a way to get into the middle of what you're, you know, not necessarily, and there, uh, Dr. Oz is not our enemy. Dr. Oz is not a, uh, a voice that we want to, to be heard and believed a hundred percent by any stretch, but he is also a voice and he's a venue and it's a way to get a message out there uh, without people even realizing it sometimes. And so to partner with them on things that we can agree about, that's actually huge. That's, that's a, that's a, you know, turning your enemy into your friend and, and using their platform to, to spread the message. That's, that's, you know, true and safe and healthy and all those other things. So, so I think, I think that's a, it's a, it's a very wise decision on her part to to bring us all together on that and you know i mean she is a media pro i mean she's been doing this yes. for years um and i'm just taking notes saying okay this is what <laughs> wanda's doing you don't want to be like wanda uh because she's awesome uh wanda that was my like wanda. Wanda be, that's right that's i want right. to be like wanda <laughs> <laughs> i knew it would come out eventually i was trying to figure out how to yeah uh so before we close things up here uh do you have any updates on on uh, geek dad or dr geek dad uh um, i'm horribly slow and very bad at video editing and so i still haven't finished the episode on on concussions i'm trying to do some animation stuff to kind of mix it up a little bit and i probably shouldn't have done that i probably should have just stuck to talking but i'm trying to make it a little fun and a little funny at the same time but also be serious and about the things that need to be uh need to be serious about and so i um at this point have um have a couple of things that I'm that I'm trying to finish up for that, but that should be out. I'm not even going to put a timetable on it. It'll be out when it's out. Um, and then uh, uh, we've started a Twitch channel. So so our, our the Geek Dads uh, have a streaming of uh, all kinds of geeky stuff. It's going to be stuff from video games to board games to uh, unboxings to stuff like this, just roundtable discussions and, and podcasts and that kind of stuff. So so if you're interested in geeky stuff or uh, uh, geeky parenting stuff specifically, then it's a good place or games. Uh, it's a good place to check things out at geekdad.com. Um, and then as always, I just kind of ramble a lot on Twitter. So at Dr. Tolbert on Twitter, a lot of tech stuff, a lot of, um, a lot of geeky stuff. 
Uh, cool. Cool. And uh, before I uh, close things up here, I want to give a big shout out. Um, Sean's in our chat room. A uh, big shout out to our good friends at the uh, Change of Shift podcast. And uh, if you haven't checked that out, it's principally a nursing podcast, but they have other content. Uh, like they had a recent show on tattooing. Whoa. Nice. Uh, uh, so definitely uh, check that out. It's, uh, it's good stuff. And uh, they just went live on iTunes tonight. So, uh, so they already have seven episodes uh up on itunes so that'll give Are you, you counting the one that you stole and put up for them uh but we'll we'll, we'll uh we'll, we'll talk about that later oh uh, sure. yeah well we'll edit we'll edit that out yeah it's just, we'll um cut it, we'll cut it out in public. We'll, we'll, we'll cut it out uh so yeah so nurse practitioners sean dent emily bennett and uh change of shift podcast are doing a great job they just started they just started up and running um just with the whole uh the view and the stethoscope thing and they just kind of started right on after that so uh so shout out to them yeah it's good stuff uh and uh so you can check me out at drmixville.com follow me on twitter follow me uh on facebook follow me on well that's probably good enough um <laughs> <laughs> but we have exciting shows coming up. So on Thursday of this week, uh, we're going to be having our good friend, Dr. Kyle Hodebeck, calling in from uh, <laughs> Istanbul, Turkey, uh, the uh, Family Medicine uh, Europe meeting. And uh, so pay attention to uh, the Twitter on that. And uh, hopefully coming up um, uh, for people outside the primary care and family medicine community, there was a there was a. a potential closure of a uh, family medicine residency program in the New York city area. And I'm trying to get uh, people from the inside to talk about it. Uh, it's very hush hush. So uh, I've been emailing back and forth with some medical students and, and some residents and some doctors there uh, to come as the, give us their story. Because uh, as we talked about on the previous show, um, you know, um, the only way to get uh, more family docs is to have uh, is to not close family medicine residency training programs. So, uh, so we definitely need that. Imagine that. <laughs> like, duh. Hey, um, Where did you say Kyle was calling from? Uh, Istanbul. Istanbul. Watching my time because I can't believe I'm 30 seconds. Really it's really thick. Istanbul, by the way, might be giants if you're interested. You're holding out on me. That's our new sound system, which we didn't even, you know. Wow, that's great. <laughs> I actually, yeah. Uh, so I did figure out how to do that. And so next time we do this stuff, I can actually bring in audio streams from stuff. I We can't do cool. the live video stuff like we were doing earlier, but uh, I can do audio. And even if the green screen cool. doesn't work, I still get sounds. So. Uh, so if people want to uh, chat with us, uh, I'm going to end this recording and uh, then we'll have people if they want to they want to call in on the on the video on the video on your on your smartphone or your computer there. So um, anything else that we got there, uh, Jerry, I think I think I, I think we plug everything we need to plug there. So. <laughs> <laughs> so until next time, friends, <laughs> I'm Dr. Mike Siller reminding you. Family Medicine Rocks. Good night, everybody.